Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The topic that I have chosen for the 2012 Lewis Connor Memorial Lecture is frugal innovation, which I suggest will be an essential contributor to the development of cardiovascular medicine in the 21st century. Of course, cardiovascular medicine has a glittering history of innovation that has resulted in a wide array of safe and effective strategies for both the prevention and the treatment of common serious cardiovascular conditions such as heart attack and stroke. However, that innovation has benefited a surprisingly small proportion of all those in need. In the 21st century, cardiovascular medicine's single largest challenge is how to provide basic cardiovascular care for the 7 billion people on the planet. About 3 billion of those alive today will go on to develop serious cardiovascular disease. And yet, around 5 billion currently have no reliable access to what all of us here would consider to be essential preventive and therapeutic care. By way of example, these are data from a study that we conducted a few years ago in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India. As part of a large rural community study, we identified about 2,500 people with a history of heart attack, shown here as acute coronary syndrome, or stroke. And as you can see, the proportions taking the standard secondary prevention drugs was extremely low. But what was perhaps most surprising was that aspirin was being taken by less than one in six people with a definite indication, despite its very widespread availability and its extremely low cost. It turned out that this was no, by no means unique. A couple of years later, the Pure study showed that in many middle and low income countries, only a small proportion of patients with a history of coronary or cerebrovascular disease were receiving appropriate basic preventive care. Much larger proportions were receiving no care. And what has become clear from these data and others is that most people in the world with serious cardiovascular disease today actually receive no treatment whatsoever. This is, I'm sure you will agree, a rather sobering observation given the enormous investment in cardiovascular healthcare development over the last few decades. So why do we find ourselves in this situation? Well, firstly, most high-risk people live in resource-poor regions of the world. We previously estimated that there are around 80 million people in North America, Europe, and other high-income countries with a 20-year risk of a major cardiovascular event of 20% or greater. In the rest of the world, however, there are 250 million people at high risk of cardiovascular disease. So how are the resources distributed between these two high-risk populations? Top 80 million have access to a cardiovascular drug market that's estimated to be worth around $100 billion annually, whereas the bottom 250 million have access to a cardiovascular drug market that's less than $20 billion. And this is roughly a 30-fold difference in the resource availability. Similarly, if you measure resource by the number of physicians, you can see that in Europe, in North America, there are about 25 to 30 physicians per 10,000 people in the population. It's about half that number in China and South America, half that again in India, and then just one doctor per 10,000 people in sub-Saharan Africa and Indonesia. Now, while the quantity of the resource is clearly critically important, the quality is also extremely important. And this shows some work that we did uh, in China with the Chinese Society of Cardiology, looking at the quality of care for patients admitted to Chinese hospitals with acute coronary syndrome. And you can see that for a very sizable proportion of very high-risk patients, the treating cardiologist decided that standard secondary prevention strategies were not indicated. Now, it seems highly unlikely that there was a compelling contraindication for these essential drugs 
for so many patients. Rather, it seems much more likely to reflect a more fundamental misunderstanding of the importance of these specific drugs and of secondary prevention itself. The other important issue that affects access to effective treatment is cost, particularly the cost of acute hospital care. Once again, this is work that we conducted in China with colleagues from Peking University, and it shows that the average cost of a hospital admission for stroke in China is around $1,600. And for those without insurance, this almost always results in what is termed here catastrophic expenditure. That is hospital costs that exceed 30 or 40 percent of annual income. But you can see that even for those who have what is deemed here to be 100 percent coverage, still a large proportion are likely to suffer extreme financial difficulties as a, cost, as a, as a consequence of medical costs that were excluded uh, by insurance cover. So where does all that leave us? Well, clearly, we have a vast unmet need for cardiovascular health care. We have a workforce that is inadequate. We have resources that are inadequate. There is enormous variation in the quality of care provided, which remains very high cost relative to the ability to pay in many parts of the world. The consequence of this is that every decade, many tens of millions die prematurely and unnecessarily from entirely preventable cardiovascular causes. Now, if we are to avert this carnage, we're going to need radical action. Current strategies and incremental changes will not be enough. We need frugal innovation. We need solutions characterized by extreme affordability, solutions that are accessible to the bottom three billion living on less than $2.50 a day. We need solutions that are economically disruptive, such that they lead to fundamental changes in market pricing from the high margin, low volume sales and services that characterize um, healthcare in the West to low margin, high volume sales and services, which is what is required in all emerging economies. So what examples do we have of frugal innovation in health? Indeed, there are many. I'll give you two examples here today. Some of you might have heard of the Jaipur leg, which is a $150 fully articulated prosthetic limb for landmine victims. And I particularly like this quote from the inventor Raj Mehta. With our design, people can kneel, squat, and climb trees, which isn't possible with other designs. And I'm absolutely sure he's right about that. Perhaps the best known example of frugal innovation in medicine is the Aravind Eye Hospital's $2 intraocular lens, which has transformed cataract surgery in India and many other countries. When it was originally introduced, the lens was 10% of existing market prices. However, Aravind hasn't restricted its innovation to technology alone. Uh, it has also extended it to service delivery, and they have developed an operating schedule in which one surgeon working with three nurses using two operating tables and six sets of procedures can perform six to eight cataract procedures per hour. And that is an output far greater than that typically uh, seen uh, in ophthalmology centers in the developed world. And if you think this rate of uh, uh, procedure is likely to result in compromised safety or quality, you wouldn't be correct. Complication rates in the Aravind hospitals are less than 2%. The rate of infection is extremely low and corrective surgery is required for less than 1%. And once again, I'm sure that many high cost ophthalmology centers in the US and elsewhere would only be too happy to achieve these sorts of outcomes. Come back to cardiovascular medicine, where do we start? It's not a straightforward question, but I believe there are several domains that we should first consider. First, we need to think about re-engineering the cardiovascular health workforce. To cope with demands, it needs to be much larger and much cheaper. It also needs to reduce variation in quality and ensure much wider implementation of affordable, appropriate evidence-based care. 
Secondly, we need to consider how low-cost technologies might facilitate expansion of the workforce and improve the quality of care. Electronic decision support has a major role to play in this regard, as does improved point-of-care diagnostics. Finally, while we have many important cardiovascular drugs coming off patent and therefore being much more widely affordable, we still need to think how we might encourage pharmaceutical innovation specifically for the emerging markets. The development of fixed dose, once a day combinations is one example of pharmaceutical innovation. But more broadly, I believe we need to see the emerging economies not only as a market for off patent generics, which remains the current model, but also as a market for new innovative products that can be profitably produced with low margins and in high volumes. So to look at these three areas in, in more detail. First, with respect to workforce, the reality is that models of primary care developed for high income countries are impractical and unaffordable elsewhere. In truth, they're probably not affordable in most high income countries either. In particular, physician centered care is not the solution. There just aren't enough doctors to do the job. They're too expensive. They're too hard to recruit and retain, particularly in disadvantaged areas where the need is greatest. And there's far too much variation in the quality of the care provided. By way of example, India currently has 500,000 doctors, but to provide US style care, India would need 3 million doctors which even with the best of intentions isn't going to happen anytime soon. An alternative is to train and equip an allied health workforce to provide basic cardiovascular care with remote medical supervision. In our program of research in Andhra Pradesh, we've engaged government funded multi-purpose health workers, also known as ARSHAs, in this task. These health workers who have 12 to 18 months training in community health are about 70% less expensive than physicians. We've trained them to perform algorithm-based screening to identify people with a history of cardiovascular disease or at high risk of its initial occurrence. And we've also trained them to make guideline-based recommendations about secondary prevention strategies. And the results are impressive the healthcare workers were much more effective than the physicians in identifying high-risk individuals. Additionally, the healthcare workers were just as good as the physicians with respect to recommending appropriate treatment. And you can see here that the agreement between healthcare workers and physicians was more than 90%. For each of these four key drug groups, and all of this, of course, was achieved at a fraction of the usual cost. We have a similar project ongoing in northern China in partnership with Peking University and Duke University, which focuses on village barefoot doctors and is designed to improve primary care for the prevention of stroke, which is the leading cause of death and disability in China. The second strategy is the development of low-cost technologies. We've been working with the Oxford Institute of Biomedical Engineering on the development of what we call Smart Healthcare, which stands for Systematic Medical Assessment, Referral and Treatment. It's designed for primary care providers and runs on a low-cost tablet mobile device with applications for patient assessment, diagnosis, treatment, follow-up and referral. Importantly, the system also facilitates continuous quality control. In the first instance, our work focuses on the primary and secondary prevention of stroke, heart disease and kidney disease and provides individualized decision support for management of blood pressure, lipids, glucose, antiplatelet therapy and tobacco cessation. We're also working with the bioengineers at Oxford on smart low cost sensors for point of, point, point of care diagnostics. This includes lab on a chip technologies, as well as sensors for a range of other cardiovascular indicators, including blood pressure, heart rate, ECG, heart sounds, even the detection of left main artery stenosis, microvascular eye disease, and echocardiography. All of this with devices that connect directly by cable or to Bluetooth to the tablet computer. 
We're also developing applications for consumers, given the ubiquity of mobile phones across the emerging economies, even among the poor. There are a wide range of possibilities, including personal risk monitoring, evaluation of early signs and symptoms of an acute cardiovascular event, medication adherent prompts, smoking cessation tools, and dietary tools. Applications are also being developed for data upload, for example, home measured blood pressure, as well as appointment scheduling. Our overall goal is to evaluate this whole package in a very large cluster randomized trial across 1,000 villages in China and India that are home to about 10 million people. We believe that if we can provide robust evidence of a worthwhile reduction in premature death and disability at a cost that is tolerable, we will greatly enhance the likelihood of population-wide scale-up. The third area for attention is the development of low-cost drugs. In part, as I said previously, this needs to involve the pharmaceutical industry in a shift from innovation focused solely on the established markets where the high margin, low volume model has generated great profits to innovation focused on the emerging markets where the key to success is likely to be the development of low margin, high volume products and services. As an example, I've chosen the fixed dose once a day combinations or polypills, which it's noteworthy have been developed almost entirely without the, the support of large pharmaceutical companies. We've been working with Dr. Reddy's Laboratories in India, a generic drug manufacturer, together with academic colleagues around the world on the development of two polypills for the secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, one for the prevention of acute coronary syndromes, and the second for the prevention of stroke. We completed an initial study with the stroke combination product a couple of years ago. As you can see, this product comprises low doses of four active agents, aspirin, simvastatin, lisinopril, and hydrochlorothiazide. The trial was conducted in many different regions worldwide, and compliance was good everywhere. In the controlled trial, LDL cholesterol was reduced by 0.8 of a millimol per litre, systolic blood pressure by 10 millimetres per minute. Per, of mercury. These changes, together with the established effects of aspirin, suggest that this combination will reduce the risk of major cardiovascular events, including recurrent stroke, by more than a half, and this at a cost that will be significantly less than the sum of the component generic parts. Now, time does not allow me to address in any detail the potential for frugal innovation to guide change in acute healthcare. But it's fair to say that in most emerging economies, a hospital admission for the management of any of these vascular emergencies is likely to be unaffordable for many and a catastrophic expense for most. Moreover, the results are likely to be highly variable with no real quality control in place. It's quite possible in these instances that there is an important role for algorithm-based acute care delivered by non-physician healthcare workers. Certainly, there's already compelling evidence that a variety of acute events previously considered only manageable by specialist physicians can be successfully managed by a specialist health worker trained in the conduct of a specific procedure. Could this be extended to the management of acute vascular syndromes, such as acute coronary syndrome? I would say the answer is almost certainly yes, but clearly this is going to require careful evaluation. So let me conclude by saying that while we might have thought we were close to reaching the end in terms of our achievements in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular conditions such as coronary and cerebrovascular disease, it turns out we're only just getting started. Nevertheless, I'm confident that if we can harness the same innovation, creativity and commitment that has helped us determine what is possible in terms of the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease, then we will find practical and affordable ways to actually implement this on the scale that the world needs. Thank you very much.